first dirigible to fly the Atlantic. It's July 6th, 1919, and the R-34, which left Scotland July 2nd, arrives over Mineola, Long Island. Despite violent storms en route and severe atmospheric disturbance over Boston, the ship arrives in Long Island after having announced she'd landed Boston. With no radio to inform ground crews of its intention, British Major Pritchard parachutes to Earth to make preparations for landing the history-making airship. The R-34 carried 4,900 gallons of petrol and covered 3,200 miles in 108 hours and 12 minutes. But after her great adventure, still must be brought to the ground. With the United States Navy's C-4 as convoy in the background and Major Pritchard's instructions as a guide, the R-34 is landing. Ropes are released and ballast thrown out of the ship as it descends on Roosevelt Field. Under command of Major G.H. Scott, the R-34 had capacity for 30 officers and men and boasted the first transatlantic stowaway, William Ballantyne, a crew member who had been stricken from the roll to lighten the ship. This is the R-34, first lighter-than-air ship to span the ocean. And now, safely anchored, it attracts the curious. Single out for special honors is Major Scott, who guided the dirigible and had as his guest on the R-34, U.S. Navy's Commander Lansdowne, later to lose his life in the Shenandoah disaster. This, however, is a moment of triumph for the crew of the airship and for the dirigible itself, the history-making R-34. If this police dog's fond companion looks something like famed comedian Charles Spencer Chaplin, he should. Her dog's friend is none other than Sid Chaplin, Charlie's less famous brother. It's 1919, and Sid is happy about his sad-faced brother's success in Hollywood. Here with President von Kleinschmidt of USC is Madame Ernestine Schumann Hank. It's 1919, and famed contralto is visiting friend and admirer. Once an obscure German housewife, Madame Schumann Hank gained fame as star of Metropolitan Opera and thrilled millions with her songs on the concert stage. This Chicago father of three is none other than Ringgold Wilmer Lardner, better known as Ring Lardner. It's again 1919, and here's writer Ring doing what comes naturally to leading sports reporter and humorist of the day. Ring's best books were about ball players and Broadway's cockeyed characters. Sailors home from the sea, New York Harbor, June 1919. Back from First World War a day ahead of time, flagship Pennsylvania leads victorious Atlantic fleet into port too soon for scheduled celebration. But captains and crews are happy to be home in the Hudson just the same. Guns that boom to victory are now silent under flag of victorious Admiral William S. Sims. Right, seen waving to admirers. Before heading home with his family, Sims calls for division of fast-growing U.S. Navy into three separate fleets. So, Secretary of Navy Josephus Daniels, June 16, 1919, signs bill to divide into three parts, Navy that will soon be second to none. Admiral Albert Gleaves commands Asiatic Fleet. In charge of Pacific squads is Admiral U.S. Rodman. New commander of Atlantic Division, Admiral Henry B. Wilson. Flag of retiring Atlantic commander Henry T. Mayo slides down superstructure of battle wagon that was his home in war. Mayo says so long to service and men who served under him. And under new commands, America's peacetime Navy sets sail for its separate seas. Here are first pictures of battle wagons in the big ditch as prows of warships of Pacific and Asiatic fleets point to far off island bases, the Philippines and Pearl Harbor. plow toward peaceful waters here, but even now there are eyes that watch for warnings of war from Tokyo. Next Navy nemesis, made in Japan. Today, battle fleets of the U.S. ply the seven seas, proudest and most magnificent war machine afloat. 
Now the Navy has wings. Now, after victory in two world wars, now with seas safe for travel and transport everywhere, squadrons of ships from destroyers to dreadnoughts, oilers to aircraft carriers, fly the banner of peace that we hope is everlasting. Here comes the complete cast of a 1918 fashion show from soup to nuts. That is, from ladies' maids to bride. After these not-so-seductive negligees come the 1918 equivalents of the good little black dress. Although what's good about it is hard to see today. Ah, it's the evening gowns and the bridal party. And finally, here comes the bride. Everything must be in perfect order before she walks the last mile. dismal, aren't they, in those black shrouds? Could be they're in mourning for the groom. Short skirts, low waistlines, pointed shoes, and frizzy hair make this a real marriage a la mode. Dean of the American Theater. It's the immortal David Velasco who developed stars like David Warfield, Francis Starr, Lenore Ulrich and whose first production was in 1889, shown buying bonds during World War I. Here's United States Surgeon General William Crawford Gorgas. For battle against yellow fever, Gorgas was awarded Distinguished Service Medal in 1918, served as Chief of Sanitation Commission in Canal Zone, died in 1920 on Independence Day. Tex Rickard in 1919, looking over fight contracts signed by Jess Willard and challenger Jack Dempsey. On field near Toledo, he'll build Wood Stadium to house coming fight for World's Heavyweight Boxing Championship. Former cowpuncher, Rickard quit Texas to join writer Rex Beach in fruitless search for Klondike gold. But here's a gold mine all his own. And here's one of two reasons crowds will jam Rickard's Toledo Stadium. It's giant Jess Willard in heavy sweater. Sure, he'll dump Dempsey in early round and retain his heavyweight crown. Jess is off to training camp where he looks like killer and in perfect condition for his July date with a strong but youthful kid from Manassa, Colorado. Determined to do his best on Independence Day, Dempsey plans to add win over Willard to his victory string. $60 top is high for times, but it's fight spectators could never forget. Dempsey knocks Willard down seven times in first round, and Willard was so battered by the end of third, his seconds threw in the towel. With Dempsey as his new attraction, Rickard draws Million Dollar Gate to New Jersey area for Jack's fight with Carpentier of France. Jack wins, and Rickard goes on to new and greater glories at old Madison Square Garden on 23rd Street in New York City. Missouri-born Tex is long way from gold fields now, but silver tinkling at turnstiles is making him rich. But he's earning it by bringing good boxers into ring. New Madison Square Garden is setting for new era in boxing. Offering nearly half million dollar guarantee to Dempsey, Rickard signs Gene Tunney, newcomer against Jack in defense of his title. Fight gate is cool two million dollars, new high. For second Dempsey Tunney battle, with Tunney now defending title, Rickard moves into Chicago's Soldiers Field. On September 22, 1927, Dempsey fails to regain his crown, but gate of over $2,650,000 is highest in history, and Rickard is hailed as greatest sports promoter of all time. Yes, Rickard found his gold at a boxing arena's gate. 